First up is how to weaponize Saluna's Seal. This chest deals 3 to 24 radiant damage to any heretics who touch it. And to get all your enemies to try to open it and take damage, all you need to do is head to the Albear Cave as a cleric of Saluna. This allows you to pick it up and add it to your inventory. From there, head to a group of enemies you want to defeat where there's also a traitor nearby. Then sell the gilded chest to the traitor, use improvised weapon to pick up the traitor and move him far away from everyone else. Use an elixir of hill giant strength to do that since your strength is probably too low as a cleric to pick anyone up and then pickpocket the chest back from him. Now that it's not your property, you can drop it right in the center of town and watch the fireworks as one by one they will try to pick it up and take damage. If any of them actually succeed the saving throw and survive, you can actually just move the chest a little bit and then they're going to start trying to pick it up again and that'll get it going again. And next up is an amulet that you can use to nearly guarantee success at making your elithid powers cost a bonus action instead of an action. This amulet is the Aberration Hunter's Amulet, and when equipped by a Githyanki, or any race disguised as a Githyanki, you can use this to nearly guarantee you succeed in getting the Awakened Permanent Condition from the Zathisk in the Githyanki Kresh. Now, in order to get the Awakened Condition, you need to pass three saving throws. The first one is a DC 12 Intelligence Saving Throw. The second one is a DC 15 Saving Throw. And the last one, you have a choice of either a Constitution, Intelligence, or a class specific saving throw. So by equipping the Aberration Hunter's Amulet and disguising as a Githyanki, you can gain advantage on intelligence saving throws, which means two of the three saving throws to get awakened, you'll have advantage on, giving you a much higher chance at success. And it's important since awakened is one of the best permanent conditions in Baldur's Gate 3. And in order to get this amulet, all you need to do is loot it off the corpse of Gastil Stornagos, the principal healer of Kresh Yellick. That's the Githyanki right next to the Zathisk. And next up, is a message from this video's sponsor, Manscaped, the global men's lifestyle brand that's disrupting the beard market. My fellow tadpole adventurers, do you want a perfect beard just like Gail? Then the Beard Hedger Pro Kit by Manscaped is for you. The king of this kit is the Beard Hedger Trimmer. The powerful 7,200 RPM motor and titanium coated T-blade can cut through the thickest of hair in a single stroke, just like how you cut down your enemies. The Beard Hedger was designed with a unique cutting angle to actually lift flat laying hairs for a clean cut. For those who spend hours on character creation, why not customize your beard length and shape too? You can choose from 20 different hair cutting lengths with the zoom wheel that uses only one guard. That's right, one guard gets you 20 lengths. This beard trimmer is waterproof, cordless, and rechargeable so you can trim in the shower to save time and create less mess. Manscaped also created dermatologist tested beard care products to help you grow and nourish a magnificent beard just like Mr. Dicarios. Their beard oil is infused with sweet almond, sunflower seed, and jojoba seed oil. Cleanse your beard with their beard shampoo that is cruelty-free, paraben-free, sulfate-free, dye-free, and vegan. Then, nourish your beard with their beard conditioner that is infused with coconut oil, shea butter, and vitamin E. And finally, style the perfect beard with their amazing beard balm that smells incredible with a fresh blend of eucalyptus, rosemary, and lavender essential oils. The complete Beard Hedger Pro kit includes includes the Beard Hedger, Beard Shampoo, Beard Conditioner, Beard Oil, Beard Balm, Travel Bag, and a free gift of beard accessories including a beard brush, beard comb, and beard scissors. If you're looking to level up, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code TOYHOUSE at checkout. That's 20% off plus free global shipping with promo code TOYHOUSE at manscaped.com. Level up today by joining over 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. And we're back. Next up, did you know any character can use the perform action while they have an instrument equipped? That's right, no need to be a bard or help Elfira come up with a song to earn the ability to perform. However, if you perform without musical instrument proficiency, then you will not be able to play well. You'll even get a condition called poor performance. And that doesn't just mean you won't get any coin for performing, it also means you'll drive everyone around you crazy. At camp, your pets will howl and growl and run away, and you'll get comments and insults such as offers to pay you to stop playing, and you can even get 
rocks thrown at you that deal bludgeoning damage. So be careful if you don't have musical instrument proficiency and you try performing. And next up is a newly discovered permanent buff, which makes you unable to be knocked prone or moved against your will. That means you can't be shoved and you can't be pushed back by spells such as Thunder Wave. This is amazing for traversing the secret chamber to retrieve the blood of Lathander and generally just great if you're melee or enjoy standing on the edge of cliffs. To get this permanent buff, all you have to do is acquire the Boots of Striding. These are worn by Minthara. Once you have them, cast any spell or cantrip requiring concentration and then unequip the boots and then cancel the spell or cantrip. You are now permanently unmovable. The way this works is that the boots grant unmovable while you're concentrating, but it goes away when you stop concentrating. But if you remove the boots and then stop concentrating, the boots aren't able to take away your unmovable condition, so it's permanent. And it doesn't show up in your list of conditions or notable features, but it is there and it is permanent. And next up, is the race that has the most unique dialogue options in Baldur's Gate 3. I'd even call it hidden because you'd never find it out unless you played this race. And that race is Gith Yankee. Reddit user Zon Conigan posted a chart showing which race and subrace has the most number of scenes that include the race subrace tags. You've probably seen them in dialogue unless you chose human, in which case you might not have seen the race subtags. On my first playthrough, I chose Loth Sworn Drow, and I was definitely surprised how many race specific dialogue options there were but after seeing this chart it is eye-opening how many Gith Yankee dialogue options there are more than triple the amount that you'd see as a Loth Sworn Drow so if you haven't played Gith Yankee you might want to give it a try to see all those unique dialogue options you wouldn't see otherwise and next up is a way to guarantee that Shadowheart won't kill the Night Song all you need to do is drop the Spear of the Night on the ground once you enter the Shadowfell then when progressing through dialogue Regardless of what you tell Shadowheart, she will react as if she just threw the Spear of the Night, skipping any persuasion checks and guaranteeing that the Night Song lives. And next up is a hidden weapon that actually makes dual wielding amazing. This weapon causes both your melee weapons to ignore resistance to slashing damage, and it's none other than the Adamantine Scimitar. Often overlooked because of the other amazing Adamantine options, this Scimitar has a passive feature called Lethal Weapon, which makes it ignore resistance to slashing damage. However, what it doesn't say is that it also applies to the other weapon you're holding too. So if you had another amazing weapon, such as Belm in your other hand, you could really deal a ton of slashing damage. And to find the mold for this weapon, you'll need to head to the Ancient Forge, Waypoint, and jump to the skeleton near the two levers, right above where Nier was trapped. That skeleton's corpse has the mold, and you can then create this amazing scimitar within the Adamantine Forge. And next up is how to send the disheveled chicken upon on the goblin camp. This chicken is rare enough on its own, only appearing if you did not encounter the owlbear cave and let the cub live. Otherwise, the owlbear cub will appear in its place. This chicken is part of the chicken chasing game. You can only play it once you've gotten Volo to stop singing, and once you pay the fee to play the chicken chasing game, you can then talk to the chicken who will complain about being so tired. And then you'll have the option to either encourage it to play the game, assuring it that it will be free at the end, or you can persuade it to unleash its fury upon the goblin camp. It's a DC 20 persuasion check, but if you pass, you will have set loose the unbridled fury of the disheveled chicken upon the goblin camp. And next up, did you know your cleric's spiritual weapon can actually grant advantage on attack rolls to your whole party? Now, when it comes to choosing spiritual weapons to summon, in almost all cases, you should choose the Great Axe, Great Sword, or Halberd. These three weapons have the ability to give your entire party advantage on their attack rolls through Lacerate, which causes bleeding for two turns. During any playthrough, you should always pick up Bual's Benediction within the Festering Cove because it is one of the few conditions that is truly permanent even if you die. More importantly, it grants advantage on all attack rolls against bleeding targets and your whole party gets the permanent condition. That means that when your spiritual weapon uses Lacerate, any follow-up attack rolls on that target will be made with advantage, which is amazing. Spiritual weapon only costs a bonus action too, making it a great spell. And you can even get Bual's Benediction without sacrificing a party member. All you have to do is enter into dialogue with the Kuatoa in the Festering Cove with just your dialogue character, then switch to 
tier sleight of hand character, have them drink a potion of invisibility and pickpocket pool drip the zealous and steal the sickle of Bual. Once you have it, progress through dialogue saying that you have just one life but can kill many in Bual's name, and then instead of getting that sickle as a reward, instead your whole party gets Bual's benediction, which is amazing. And next up is a strange interaction that lets you enjoy infinite short rests. This is possible through the Bard class action Song of Rest. Using this is the equivalent of taking a short rest, and what's insane about it is that you can use it again after simply changing areas. By going from Act 2 to Act 1, for example, that will refresh your Song of Rest, allowing you to use it again. So anytime you want to take another short rest, just change zones, and you can use this to save elixirs. And it's especially good for classes that really only need short rests. Classes like monks who get all their key points back from a short rest, or warlocks who get all their warlock spell slots back from a short rest. And next up is an item that only appears for some players and not for others. That item is located atop the ruined building with ogres within the blighted village. The item itself doesn't hold a lot of value to be sold to traders, but instead references a playable character from Larian's Divinity Original Sin 2. This item is none other than the portrait of Ifan Ben Mezd and can only be found if the digital deluxe upgrade was purchased. And next up is Force Conduit. This amazing condition reduces slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning damage taken by one per turn remaining, and each time the wearer takes those types of damage, they gain two turns of Force Conduit. This makes this condition extremely powerful against large groups of enemies that don't have very strong attacks. And once you get seven turns of Force Conduit, then it does a massive AoE damage of Force Damage. You can see that once you get four or more turns of Force Conduit, you can really reduce the amount of damage you are taking by quite a lot. And one source of Force Conduit can be found on the Rippling Force Mail. This armor can be found on the second floor of Damon's Blacksmith inside a rustic chest. And next up, is the Forge of the Nine and the incredible items that can be made there. This forge is only available if you kept Damon alive all the way until Act 3, otherwise it's just an empty forge. Once Damon is set up at the Forge of the Nine, he sells some pretty incredible items, and since you can get these pretty much as you enter Act 3, if you just walk straight there, it's a great reward to help you start gathering the other amazing equipment that you can find in Act 3. One such amazing item at the Forge of the Nine are the Boots of Persistence. These boots grant freedom of movement and long strider permanently. Both of these are great conditions, granting movement speed and immunity to movement speed impairing effects, and cannot be paralyzed, which is great against ghouls. Legacy of the Masters grants plus two to attack and damage rolls with weapons, which is great, and the Armor of Persistence reduces all incoming damage by two and grants plus one to all saving throws and resistance to bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage in the form of resistance and blade ward. Very good items that grant actual spells permanently as part of their passive features. And next up is a hidden interaction with spell might gloves. These gloves grant an additional 1d8 damage to your spells that use attack rolls at the cost of minus 5 to the roll. However, these gloves actually work with all smites other than divine smite, granting the additional 1d8 damage and without any penalty to the attack roll. So these seemingly spellcaster gloves can actually be a nice addition to a paladin if you want some extra damage to your smites. And to get these Spellmite gloves, all you need to do is loot them off Lucretius or complete the quest Find Dribbles the Clown in Act 3 within the Circus of the Last Days. And next up is a rare item that is not actually unique. Now, for almost all rare items, you can only ever find one, especially from merchants. But one item from Damon's stock will always come back even after you buy it. And that item is the Thorn Blade. This scimitar adds 1d4 poison damage if you are concentrating. And what's cool about this blade is that since you can get more than one, if you decide to dual wield them while concentrating, you'll get 2d4 poison damage instead of 1d4. And while it's not the best scimitar in the game by a long shot, it's a hidden interaction you might not have noticed since every other rare item is actually unique and you can only get one. And next up is a hidden lamp. This lamp is stashed away in Nine Fingers Vault beneath Baldur's Gate in Act 3. This lamp is unlike any others in that it can actually be used. Now unfortunately, it doesn't do anything significant, it just makes your character say a line of dialogue about it. Tav will say it's just an ordinary lamp without a touch of magic, Shadowheart is sure there's a buyer who will believe that it's magic, and Karlak will just sort of shout lamp when you use it. Beyond that dialogue, it does appear that this lamp is simply, in fact, an ordinary oil lamp. 
And next up is an item called Chancer's Karakonet. This item is probably not known by most players because this item did not even exist until patch 6. To get this rare amulet, you must head to the Undercity Ruins and go behind Voiceless Penitent Bareki, where a skull rests inside a pouch. Loot the skull and bring it to the Lower City Sewers, where you will find a skeleton missing a head. By reuniting the head of the skeleton to the body, you will be rewarded with this amulet. Prior to patch 6, this item was in the game but was simply called Magic Amulet. And while the amulet isn't that great, it can be used to make your next attack roll or saving throw with advantage by using a reaction. And next up is how to steal the incredible Amulet of Greater Health. This amazing amulet is one of the best amulets in the game and can be found within the House of Hope on top of a marble plate. Now usually to steal this amulet, you'd need to disarm the marble plate, which requires you perceive it and then pass the DC 20 sleight of hand check. Instead, you can actually just place an item that is at least as heavy as the item you're stealing. I chose a one pound item and then place it on the plate before you steal the amulet of greater health. Then once you steal it, there will be no reaction. Nothing's actually going to happen. You can get away with stealing it. You do still need to occupy the archivist so that he doesn't see you pocketing it. But other than that, it's a very easy steal and replace. And next up, are Dame Aelin's Moonlight Slivers. These incredibly powerful Celestials are summoned by Dame Aelin when you try to turn her into Leroican. The cinematic with their entrance is epic and their conditions are even more so. There's a condition called Saluna's Ire, which grants these Slivers a reaction when attacked to deal 12 to 144 radiant damage. That is absolutely insane. They also cast Silvered Bulwark, which is the equivalent of Globe of Invulnerability. It's one of the hardest fights in Baldur's Gate 3 to be sure, and probably most people won't experience it because it involves betraying the Night Song after saving her back in Act 2. And next up is a strange weapon that has no proficiency label. The Justicier Scimitar seems to have lost its proficiency classification. Even though Scimitar is in the name, you don't need to have proficiency with Scimitars to use it without penalty, which is great because it also has an amazing passive which makes your attacks cause blinding if you attack with advantage. And there's plenty of ways to attack with advantage, and once they are blinded, you can continue to cause blind since attacks against blinded targets are made with advantage. It is worth noting, though, that despite the tooltip suggesting it's any attacks you make, shadow blinding applies only to attacks made with the Justicier's Scimitar. And to get this odd weapon, you need to head to the Gauntlet of Shar and go to the Infernal Effigy. If you light one of the candles, a rat will appear, slay it, and then many more will spawn. After you slay them all, Lithindor will spawn, and you can slay him, and he will drop this weapon. 